this past week, I've never been kept count, but I think I may have broken my personal record for the most weddings attended in a three-month span. I attended wedding number four last Thursday. Um, and I love weddings, so no complaint here. I just love a good wedding. Um, and the most important thing about a wedding is, of course, the wedding, right? The, the vows, making just one good brief point, exchanging rings, kiss the bride, present the newly minted married couple, hopefully sign the certificate that says this is legal. Um, that's when the crying happens. That's when you're nervous. Husband and wife, the whole thing. Um, that may be the important part. That may be when we're fighting back tears. But there is a good reason why most couples ask me, if you could, could we keep that part to about 20 minutes? And there's a reason why I always oblige. Because after the wedding comes the reception. And that's when the fun happens. And I like the fun part. That's the celebration, right? There's, there's food and there's laughter and there's sitting around a table with your friends and there's the husband and wife just walking around and meeting people and laughing and smiling and pictures and more food, right? It's just, it goes from wedding to wedding feast to wedding banquet to party, right? So you can imagine my surprise last Thursday when I went to my very first Catholic wedding. And it lasted an hour and a half. Yeah, I lasted about 40 minutes. I tracked as long as I could. And um, that priest, he obviously knew there were unwashed pagans such as myself sitting out there because, man, he was passionate about making sure that we knew that when he spoke, this bread was going to become the flesh of Jesus and this wine was going to become the blood of Jesus. And boy, he was hammering down on all the points and um, it just kept going on and on and on. And um, the couple just was enjoying themselves so much. Like, you know, I could just talk about all the things I didn't understand. I didn't understand why this massive, expensive flower arrangement that took two people to carry that was offered to a statue of the Virgin Mary. I didn't understand that, but you know what? They were having a good time. Whenever somebody sang a song, they'd look at each other and sing the song, and they were laughing and smiling. And so when I saw this newly minted husband this week, he said to me, what'd you think? Well, let me just go point by point through all the theological errors that I think I encountered. No, I said, you know what? You two had so much fun at your wedding. That was the best because it's your wedding, not mine. So I'm glad you had fun. I loved watching you two smile, but I did not go to the party after because after an hour and a half of that, I was just pretty much roasted. So this morning we come to Revelation 19 and... Um, we're getting closer to the end of Revelation, and um, we come to a banquet, a feast, a party. Um, but guess what? There's not one. There's two. Two banquets, two feasts, two suppers um, in Revelation 19, and one of them is a wedding supper, and the other one is absolutely, most definitely not a wedding supper. Supper. It's a judgment supper, if you've ever heard of it. I've never attended one of those. Um, and a whole lot has been written about the first one, not a lot about the second one. And I just want to lead up to it, point out a few things, and share communion with you. I want to talk about the praise that goes into the, to these banquets. 
and the preparation that goes into these banquets. But then I just kind of want us to, to be thinking as we look at these and thinking about some questions maybe in our own hearts. Questions about motives when we think about judgment and maybe even when we pray for judgments. Questions about our own ability to think long-term and to distinguish between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. Because that's where we are. We're at Revelation 19. We're at the end. And the first thing I just want to point out is we are back in this pattern, this back-and-forth pattern of praise and judgment, praise and judgment, praise and judgment. This is, I hope it, this isn't feeling tedious to you. I think we're done with, with praise and judgment, praise and judgment. But this has pretty much been every week, right? It's this, it's this pattern where there's this, right, there's, there's seals and trumpets and bowls and there's judgment. And then it's like we cut away to heaven and there's worship happening, so you come to Revelation, you go, oh, look, more judgment. Oh, look, more worship. And this, this question struck me this week. Is, is the book of Revelation like action scenes interrupted by worship scenes? Or is it worship scenes interrupted by like action and judgment? Like, is worship always happening? Like, we interrupt this worship to bring you some judgment, right? And is it possible to just kind of keep holding on to both as you go through Revelation? But last time we were here, we saw the fall of Babylon, and it was long and and ugly, 17, 18, two chapters worth. And we come to chapter 19, and and, and it starts with, with, with praise, and, and I barely covered this last time, but I want to get into it a little more again. 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out. Now, this is simply the little word saying. But the word saying is translated differently depending on the context. So if your Bible says saying, I'm just going to question the people who thought that a great multitude in heaven worshiping says. Like, can you imagine a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. No, they're crying out. They're shouting, right? Babylon is fallen, right? You sing about that. Anybody who knows old bluegrass gospel music knows there's a song, Babylon is Fallen. That seems like a strange thing to sing in church on a Sunday morning or at the bluegrass festival, but it's true. I see David back there smiling. He knows that song. He's from East Tennessee. Babylon is Fallen, to rise no more, right? Throw in the banjo. Yeah, I, he's about to really identify with me. Here, when I first started going to church, I'm like 19 or 20. I'm way back on the back. And what I did not know that was about three rows from the fourth in the middle, there was an elderly lady. Her name was Miss Rash. Tragic last name. But Miss Rash was the sweetest, most dear lady you've ever met. And she had a special needs daughter who was middle-aged. And it was just the two of them. They lived alone together um, in a home and a house. And um, Miss Rash loved Jesus. And sometimes... You know, if there was like in the middle of a song or in the middle of the sermon, she would just get so filled with thanksgiving and praise that she would just begin to shout at the top of her lungs, praise to the Lord. Now, if you're 19 and you just set foot in church from the first time since you were like six, that's a shocker. Um. And then this like new youth pastor came in and like this youth group started going and they all started sitting in the front. And let me tell you, if you're like 15 years old and you just met Jesus and the lady behind you starts shouting in church right in your ear, that was almost like, watch this. This kid's about to jump out of their skin. 
because Miss Rash just gets just so full to bursting that she couldn't contain herself. She wasn't, she wasn't thinking about restraint. She wasn't thinking about her dignity, right? And these people aren't thinking about restraint. They're shouting out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to who? Our God, not their God's our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged, are we even allowed to use that word? Avenged on her the blood of his servants. Do you see what's happening here? Well, the first thing that's happening here is, um, I may have mentioned this before, um, all the worship happens in Revelation, and this is the first time we see the word hallelujah. And to the best of my knowledge, this may actually be the first time we see the word hallelujah in the New Testament. How about that? You have to go this far to find... It's all over the Psalms. And the interesting thing about hallelujah in the Psalms is that the majority of the time in the Psalms, the word hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, which is why the word travels the globe usually has to do with some sort of connection to the punishment or the judgment of the wicked and how salvation is tied in with that as if they saw that salvation was this deal in situations like this where, where God's salvation of us included his judgment of the wicked. So hallelujah. So in Two verses, they say hallelujah, and they use the words judgment, judged, and avenged. They can't contain themselves. They're praising the Lord for judgment. Verse 3, once more they cried out, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. What a thing to praise the Lord for. She's just going to burn and burn, and burn. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down. Fell down? That doesn't mean they tripped. It means they literally threw themselves down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, and then number three, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. So, Again, just real quick, I mean, if you go back through the Psalms and you just see all the times people prayed for judgment of the wicked and then you see it happening and it's accompanied by the word hallelujah, it's like answered prayer happening. And we'll come back to that in a minute before we get to communion. But this leads in verse 6 to the first supper of Revelation 19. Verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. And listen to the description. Like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out. Imagine so many voices, it sounds like Niagara Falls in the middle of a thunderstorm. Okay? And they're shouting, uncontained. And they're saying what for the fourth time? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For the Lord who? Our God. Our God. The Almighty reigns. He rules. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. And now here we go. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. In verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this. He's literally telling him what to write down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. What I just told you to write, those are God's words. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, you must not do that. <laughs> I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Stop it. 
for this testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Not just the Lord God, the Lord our God. The dragon doesn't reign. The beast doesn't reign. The other beast doesn't reign. Babylon doesn't reign. None of the kings reign. Our God reigns. After all they've seen, after all they've experienced, they're now heading into a wedding banquet, a wedding supper. And there's a bride, it says, the marriage of the lamb has come. Blessed are the invited ones. Who's that? Doesn't well. It's obvious when you get to chapter 19 that the sides are very clear, as we're going to see in a moment when we get to verse 11. But there's something that's very striking here, because do you remember one of the descriptions of the desolation of Babylon? was that there was not the sound of a wedding. There was no singing, there was no rejoicing, and there was no sound of a wedding. And what's the, one of the first celebrations you see at the fall of Babylon? A wedding supper. A wedding celebration. We're not going to spend a ton of time here because I think there's a reason why this is here. If you go back to Jesus' day and you think about a Jewish wedding, if you think about the parents choosing a bride and a groom and the parents working out, these two are going to get married. It wasn't like, you know, let's get on match.com find somebody. It was like, no, you, these are picked. And then when the time for the marriage ceremony had come, the groom would leave his home with his friends and go to the home of the bride and escort her from her home to his, even if she didn't know the exact time when he would come. And when they got to his house, there would be a wedding feast that would go on for maybe a week. You can imagine what it's like Jesus sends for his people and invites them to the wedding. Now, next week, we're going to get to this thing where he keeps saying a thousand years, a thousand years. And, and theologians love to argue about, like, is this on earth? Is this in heaven? Is this just a little thing that happens at the beginning of the millennium? Is the entire millennium the marriage supper? Or is entire eternity the marriage supper? And here's, here's just what I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to say there's three verses here about a wedding supper, and we can connect a whole lot of verses to this, um, but I don't, I don't think the point in this particular passage is for us to build a great big theology of a wedding supper from these three verses. I think the point is that there's another supper, and I think this one is placed here to show us the, the stark, stark, drastic contrast between the, gr the grace and the blessing of the groom for his bride, the church, and the fearsome power and might of the very same groom when he comes in judgment for a second supper. And look at this. And this is when we start getting in. If, if you, I've got them all circled in my Bible for, for the next few chapters, we're going to see seven of these verses that start with the words, then I saw, then I saw, then I saw. Next week, we'll see a, a few of these, then I saw. But he starts with, then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So some, someone named Faithful and True is on a horse, and he's coming to battle. And his, his coming to war is, is in perfect righteousness and justice. We're, we're not used to, to war in righteousness and justice always, right? And his eyes are like a flame of fire, exactly the way he saw him at the beginning of Revelation. And remember, this is John. John walked around Judea with Jesus. It's like, Jesus didn't used to look like that. 
And on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself, and he has a cloth. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The Word of God. So the one who in the desert, who was tempted by Satan, if you'll bow to me, you get a kingdom, all the kingdoms of this world. (laughs) He said, no, now comes back. He's wearing crowns. And he's the word. He's the word. This is the Logos from John chapter 1. Same guy. He is the word. He's got eyes of fire. And he's faithful and true. And it says, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, So this is either the same people who are at the wedding or they're just dressed like the people who are at the wedding, which you have to admit would be pretty wild, like if after a wedding party they said, okay, guys, get on your horse, we're going to war. But we don't, yeah, who knows. Um, They're all dressed, and they've all got their own white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, again, Psalm 2. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He just speaks, and that's his weapon. So you remember back a couple of chapters ago, we had this this Armageddon, this Megiddo. Remember all the kings, it said, were coming to fight, to make war against the lamb and his followers. And so you can imagine, they're just probably armed to the hilt. You're like, well, this doesn't seem fair. There's a guy on a horse and all he's got is his word. (laughs) It's not fair for them. And I saw this angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called out to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Here it is. Pay attention. Verse 17. Come, gather for the great supper of God. It's the second supper. The second supper of chapter 19 to eat the flesh of kings, because the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both slave and free, great and small. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image." These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on this horse. And all, boy, here's a verse, all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This must be millions of birds gorged. They're like hopping around on the ground, unable to fly, I guess, just full of the flesh of this army that dared to oppose the word of God. And he just did it, it says, with the sword that came from his mouth. He just spoke. So it's not like the rest of the people on horses needed any weapons. They're just watching it. He judges the world in righteousness. They shatter like a piece of pottery. The first supper was a marriage the second supper was a battle. And yet, seeing this coming, they are preceded with hallelujah. Hallelujah for the wedding, hallelujah for the judgment. Okay. So we need communion to kind of help us sort our hearts out for a little minute here, okay? 
just just a couple of things here. Um, because I know that in my own heart, there's this line that just gets really blurry. I don't know about you. Well, I probably do. Um, I know God's judgment is coming. But I also know there's people that I would really like revenge on. And frankly, there's just people I'd love to see fail. (laughs) Where is that line? Right? And... Can I say with 100% certainty that the person that I want to fail is someone that God's going to judge? Or can I say with 100% certainty that the person I want revenge on is someone that God will judge? Because I'd better be careful there. So what, what? With righteousness, he judges and makes war. His name is faithful and true. Just and true are your ways. And then if you flip that around, just the celebration of the victory of the word, of the lamb, of the king. And where's that line in my heart? Like, Can I celebrate the victory of good wherever that good happens? Because frankly, I wish it was my team that was doing all the good stuff and sometimes somebody else, well, right? (laughs) So I've got these lines where I, I want vengeance and I want to win and I want those people to lose, right? And it's all blurry sometimes. And how do we keep that straight? I think it's, it's things like communion, and I think, it's, I think it's when we're led in worship that we keep the lines drawn in the right places because if there's one thing that, you know, Joey tells us this, we've read this in Revelation, worship is about two things. It's about your treasure, and it's about your allegiance, Right? What did he just say? Those who worshipped and who who gave their allegiance to the beast, right? So worship is is like, okay, let's let me just keep the lines in my heart drawn correctly. The Lord our God reigns. That's where my worship, that's where my allegiance is. The Lamb who was slain, that's where my worship, that's where my allegiance is. So worship does that. But then we come to the this. And oh my goodness, we start dealing with issues of justice and then we realize on the cross, justice came. We, we, we sang this. Behold the man on the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Like justice came at his expense, right? Right? Like he took justice upon himself. So he paid for justice to happen. So, so then there's this idea that love was incredibly costly. And so this orients us around the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of man, justice and love do not work that way, Right? And then there's this last way this orients us because um, as we're going to see next week and and as we see here, um, we just, we need to be convinced. We prayed this right at the beginning of the morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We're going to talk about this a whole lot more, but Jesus said this, you know, if, if my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight. If my, so he was constantly trying to get us to distinguish the kingdom. But, but if we want to tie this here, um, for one, 
Well, let's look at it this way. Um, communion answers the three big questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Do you remember how Paul kind of delayed this out for us? As often as you do this, what's that? As often as you do that, that's why we're here. So as often as you're here, remember the cross. As often as you're here, remember the body and blood of Jesus. As often as you're here, encourage each other around the body and blood of Christ. As often as you're here, worship around that. As often as you're here, remember this. But then there's the word remember. As often as you're here, remember. You go back. And you remember who you were before you became a new creation in Christ. You remember who he was and what he did on the cross and in the empty tomb. So as often as you're here, you look back and you remember. And then what does he say? Until he comes. The Lord's Supper orients all of history. But it, all, it orients all of our personal histories. This is where I come from. This is why I'm here and apparently this is where we're going because when Jesus ate it with his disciples, what did he say? I'm not going to drink this with you again until my kingdom comes. And I don't know if we just witnessed this or not. Maybe it was here. Maybe this is when he breaks out the wine. <laughs> it's supper. And we'll say, cool, Jesus is drinking wine again. He's been waiting for this. So communion helps us keep the lines in our heart, the lines of justice, the lines of worship, the lines of who's the winner, oriented and clear because they get all messed up. But the two suppers, the lines are very, very clear. You couldn't pick two more stark images than a wedding and a war. A feast birds gorged with flesh or a feast of people dressed in pure white with the lamb who is the groom his people the bride so let's let's take a moment now with communion to kind of orient our past um, orient our present orient our future and I wonder if as we take this um I really was moved by that, little, that last line. We repeated it in the song. Um, this I know with all my heart. His wounds have played, paid my ransom. This is, this is um, we, can, we can touch and taste and smell and feel, you know, the wounds here. Um, Do you know with all your heart that the wounds of Jesus Christ have paid your ransom? Do you know with that with all your heart this morning? I pray that you do. Um, and I pray that as you take this, it would be thankfulness. Yes, this I know. Your wounds paid my ransom, and I remember it now with this. Lord, thank you for brothers and sisters um, who um, gather around these elements with me today and die with them. Um, if we drill down to what we have in common, it's this. It's this, the body and blood of Jesus. That is the center of our fellowship. Lord, we depart here today with gratitude in our hearts for what you've done for us, for what you're doing for us and we leave with hope of what you're going to do. And we leave with a message that burns and we don't want to try to contain it, hide it under a bushel, Lord, as you said, hide it under a basket. Pray that we would shine brightly in this week to come, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.